again, let's take a look in Romans chapter 13 this morning. And uh, I want to share in reading this from a different translation than what you probably have in front of you. I uh, mentioned a while back, Anthony Buzzard, who many of us know, has come out with a literal word-for-word -word translation of the New Testament. And uh, you can compare what I read with your translation. But I want to read the first eight verses of Romans 13. And we'll consider these words together this morning. The Apostle Paul writing says, Everyone must obey government authorities. Because no one has the power to rule unless God gives permission. These authorities have been appointed by God. Whoever resists the authorities opposes what God has put in place, and they will be judged accordingly. For rulers are not a, not a threat to those who do right, but to those who do wrong. If you do not want to live in fear of the authorities, then do what is right, and you will have their approval. Those in power are God's servants, appointed to their office for your own good. If you do wrong, you should be frightened. It is not without reason that authorities wield the sword. They are God's servants, punishing offenders. So it is important to do what they tell us, not just because of the threat of punishment, but because of what your conscience tells you. That is why you must all pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants taking care of such things. Pay whatever you owe them. Taxes to the tax authorities. Fees to the fee collectors. Give respect to those who should be respected. Honor to those who should be honored. Do not owe anybody anything except love for one another. For those who love their neighbors have fulfilled the requirements of the law. Interesting rendition of those verses. God and government. Most of us have lived under, under only one system of government, namely the United States system of government, which is a democracy. And since it is a democracy, it encourages the participation of its citizens. And because we have the right to participate in this particular system of government, there is always ongoing discussion and debate among American citizens. And we even can be critical of the system of government. In fact, many of the discussions I hear and maybe take part in, we are rather critical of how government operates or does not operate. And we can do that and we don't worry about the implications because government is not likely to threaten us and government is not likely to persecute us just because we are critical of it. That is a privilege we enjoy in this country, but not every government operates that way. Many governments of the world right now, if you are critical of how they run it, that's a serious matter. You will find yourself in a lot of trouble. Such would be the system of government that the Apostle Paul writes about in Romans chapter 13. If you've ever gone through history class, you know about the Roman Empire. And you know how there were times when it was a very, very ruthless system. That, not the American system of government, is what the, Paul, what the Apostle Paul writes about in the verses that we've just read. There is a dilemma for the followers of Christ. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And at the start, there was a great deal of misunderstanding. When in the Roman Empire, believers would openly declare that Jesus is Lord, on the surface, it sounded like a threat to the system of government that existed. And so... What is the responsibility? What was the initial responsibility of citizens to their government? The Apostle Paul pointed out in the previous chapter, Romans 12, verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12 we think are very, very important talking about the mental priorities that we have and realizing there is a world system that would have us conform to it and, of course, government takes the lead with that conforming influence. And so government, in particular, wants us to conform to a particular system. And the Apostle Paul says, do not bow to the pressure of government to conform to that system of the world. Rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Live with a different mindset. Live with a different lifestyle. And so as Paul points that out, then we come down to the government that would have us conform. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to thumb our nose at government and again say Jesus is Lord? We realize government along with the rest of the world wants us to conform in an ungodly manner. 
We don't want to do that. Are we supposed to thumb our noses at government? Verse 1 is very, very clear. Paul says every person, and I emphasize those first two words, every person, no exceptions, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. And so if we look at the previous chapter, Romans 12 and verse 2, and we see what Paul says about that, don't conform to the system, and government that would have us conform to the system, Paul sets the record straight that even though that influence is out there, every single one of us, whether we agree with the government or not, he doesn't qualify it, every single person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. The reason why he says that is the case, the last part of verse 1, there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Amazing statement. Amazing implications regarding the earthly governments of the world. Paul says there is no authority in place except which God has established. Every government that exists, exists because God has authorized it to exist. The book of Daniel talks a great deal about the rise and fall of political powers. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, a very interesting summary statement. It says concerning God that He removes kings and He establishes kings. God takes them down. God sets them up. But they all operate under the divine authority of Creator God. Now, I pause and think just a little bit about the fact that every government that ever has been and ever will is established by God. And I'm a little bit shocked as I think about what Paul is saying here. Because there have been a lot of different kinds of governments throughout the ages. There have been a lot of really good governments. We appreciate the, the benefits and the privileges of this democratic system that we live under. But there have been some horrible systems of government, some incredibly wicked, some very ruthless leaders. And as I think about what Paul is saying here, it really is difficult for me to wonder why someone like Adolf Hitler ever came to power. And to wonder why modern day ISIS is a current example, why ISIS is allowed to grow and, and to increase and become a great threat somehow in ways that I think we cannot understand, God has ordained all systems to exist. Jeremiah chapter 27, verse 6. God says, Now I have given all these lands, and the lands he's talking about also included the land of Israel, I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the last phrase is the kicker, my servant. Read the book of Daniel, and toward the end of his life, Nebuchadnezzar came to realize that God was God. But make no mistake, he was a ruthless dictator. He was not a good man to those countries that were conquered. He conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, dispersed the people of Israel, and in some ways fulfilled the plan of God. But God called even a, a man like that, my servant. So... We are to be in subjection to government because God's established every form of government. And so we submit, regardless of the government that we live under, we are called to submit to that system of government. The implication of what he says in verse 1 is found in verse 2. Therefore, because that is the case that God has established all the governments, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. And so Paul takes it one step further. Whether you like your government or not, whether government seems good or bad, it is established by God. And as such, if you choose to resist the government over you, you literally in, are in disobedience to God and you are uh, potentially able to come under the judgment that God would have for you, even His wrath, by so doing. And so then verses 3 and 4, he talks about legitimate government. I think he's qualifying what he writes here in verses 3 and 4 because he says, the purpose of government is to reward that which is right and to punish that which is wrong. And I think there's a subtle message. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. Uh, but I believe that Paul is saying that government is designed under the authority of God to operate this way. This is the plan of God. Government is there to enforce and reward what's right but also to punish the evildoer. It is interesting that Paul does not state that government defines 
what is right and wrong, but it rewards what's right and it punishes what is wrong. Verse 5, Paul takes us further and, and appeals to us in our conscience to obey government. It's not just the thing that we do externally, but in our minds we know that this is the thing we do in submitting to government. It finally gets down to verses 6 and 7. He gets into the very unpopular issue of paying taxes. I doubt that any people in any government has ever enjoyed paying taxes. And here we're coming up not too far into the future, April the 15th, tax day. And so we are reminded that we have a duty also to pay taxes. And not only does Uncle Sam tell us that, but now the Apostle Paul says we have, as believers in Christ, we have a responsibility to pay our taxes. So if we are to submit to government, which we recognize government is ordained of God, if government is sanctioned by God to reward what is right, to punish what is wrong, Bottom line is it takes money for government to do that, and so thus we are supposed to pay our taxes. So verse 7, Paul gives us a summary. Render to all what is due them. So he, we have a summary of all of our responsibilities. If there is tax that we are supposed to pay, then we pay what is due. If there is a custom that is to be paid, we are to pay that. If we are to fear and respect those in government, we are to do so. We are to honor those over us because honor is due to them. And ultimately then, he gives us one overarching law and principle over everything. Verse 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So if I understand Paul correctly, as he talks the, about the highest law of all, love the Lord your God with heart, mind, and soul, love your neighbor as yourself, then apparently obedience to government fits under that great umbrella of the great commandment. So here we have eight verses that tell us concerning our highest duty, and in particular, our duty to government. As I said, this is Palm Sunday. Why in the world are we talking about government today? We've gathered here to remember the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Doesn't it seem a little off base to be talking about government and our responsibility to government, I do believe there is a connection. And I want to bring that connection to bear here this morning. Even, I believe, the king of the coming kingdom of God, the ultimate government, on Palm Sunday we are reminded, and in the, week, or the days that followed in this coming week, we are reminded that the king of the kingdom of God submitted to government, and in particular submitted to government that would do him wrong in every sense of the word. So we lift it up because we have no greater example. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus have us do? Look at what he did going in willingly on Palm Sunday. Riding in peacefully upon a donkey. Riding in to submit to that which he knew would take place. Knowing how he would be treated by the religious leaders. Knowing how he would be treated by the Roman officials willingly did it, and the amazing thing, as we know, is he had the power to prevent it all. He could have called 10,000 angels to rescue him from that desperate situation. He gave us a great example. We submit to government even as Jesus submitted to government. And how he remained quiet before those who would accuse him. How he endured the horrible punishment and treatment that he was to receive. And it's especially noteworthy... In John chapter 19, verse 11, as he stood before Pilate, the man who had the right of life and death over him, he answered to him and he said, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. I think those words are punctuated by what we just read in Romans chapter 13. Again, a man who would sentence the sinless Son of God to death the authority that he had, and I think Jesus was appealing to him in that moment, saying, you would not have any authority over me except God in his provision and his will has granted it at this hour. And so you have authority over me now in this moment. But the irony is, King of kings and Lord of lords, he's got the authority over every government and over every individual. But Jesus has modeled for us. Obedience to government, and again, even a government that would seem to operate outside the standards established by God to reward what was right and to punish what was wrong. What could be worse than the sinless Son of God who deserved the very best, who was sentenced to death? 
thinking again about Paul's words in Romans 13 and government. We've enjoyed a lot of privileges and benefits in the government that we live under, but you know there are a lot of great concerns that many of us as followers of Christ have about the direction of government today. There is legislation that's passed that we consider to be morally and biblically wrong. We are faced with increasing dilemmas because what's a believer to do when government takes action that is contrary to the will of God? Do we resist by refusing to pay our taxes? Well, I'm sure that wouldn't go terribly well. Organizing protest. Is that the thing that the people of God do? Rise up and protest that which they disagree with. Do we try very, very hard to elect moral leaders to office to try to reverse that legislation? Or perhaps even ourselves, do we try to run for office so that we can make a difference from those positions? Those are all challenging questions and questions that are not easy to answer, but this much I know. This much is certain from what we have just read. Regardless of any of those things, there is one role that remains for us as followers of Christ. And that again is, we submit to the government that is in power over us. There is one exception that I'm aware of. If government forces our hand, if government gives us an ultimatum that we obey it or we obey God. We are drawn back to the words of the Apostle Peter, Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We must obey God rather than men. And we realize that's where the ultimate authority lies. If we are forced with a choice, and thus far I do not believe we are forced with that choice, but if we are forced with a choice, we know where our duty lies. We must, as Peter said, obey God rather than men. One writer says that whenever obedience to man is inconsistent with obedience to God, then disobedience becomes a duty. And again, that's a duty not to be taken lightly. I'm thinking again of Jesus on trial before the Roman authorities, a government, again, that was doing something very, very wrong, it would so seem, and yet fulfilling the will of God in another way. But one of the things that cannot be said of Jesus when he was on trial was that the government did not force him and give him an ultimatum to compromise morally. That would have been a far different dilemma. He submitted, but even at that, no doubt, he would have had to have resisted. Again, another writer says the design of civil government is not to promote the advantages of the rulers, but of the ruled. They are ordained and invested with authority to be a terror to evildoers and a praise to them that do well. They are the ministers of God for this end and are appointed for this very thing. On this ground, our obligation to obedience rests, and the obligation ceases when this design is systematically, constantly, and notoriously disregarded. There is an exception. But again, it is not an exception to be taken lightly. An interesting side note on what Paul says in Romans 13. He wrote this letter to the Romans to the Christians. But it's considered that Paul also anticipated it was not just for the eyes of believers. That there was a very good chance that the government authorities would also read those words. And if that is the case, and I believe that is the case, I believe that Paul has worded what he's worded here very carefully, knowing that both sets of eyes would fall upon it. And so he's making a statement to the government as well, saying as far as your concern about believers who declare that Jesus is Lord, know this, that they have a God-given responsibility to submit to you. They are not a threat to you. And so perhaps his words were designed to head off persecution, which would come and did come shortly after the time that Paul wrote those words. But again, these are words probably directed at government as well as followers of Jesus Christ. Again, he states, every government exists through the authority of God. To oppose government authority is to disobey God. Legitimate government function is to reward that was right and to punish what is wrong. Taxes, he says, are to be paid to support government and rulers in doing the very thing, in doing the right thing, rewarding right and punishing evil. And in his words, he may have given us an exception when government does not do those things. He says, submission is a matter not only of external obedience, but also respect and honor. And so the duty that we have is both in attitude and in action. And again, finally, there is but one exception. When government forces our hand to do something ungodly, we know where our decision ultimately must be.
I think that Paul frames it all in verses 11 and 12, and I think these are very important words to look at this morning in closing. Do this in verse 11. He says, Knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds in dark, of darkness and put on the armor of light. Paul says you have a temporary duty. And again, I think the events of Palm Sunday remind us there will be a change of government. We look forward to that change of government. We believe it will be coming soon. The night is far spent. The day of the return of Christ, we believe, is near. But in the meantime, our temporal duty remains that we submit to this government until it is overthrown by the Son of God to set up the perfect government which is to come. Again, I think these words fit well as we consider the events of this day as we consider the King of Kings and the implication of our duty to Him. Let's pray.